I'd like to welcome everyone to the IMWG conference series uh, for 2019 uh, from Orlando, Fl Florida. Uh, this is the one which is dealing with the best of ash. First of all, I'd like to thank our sponsors uh, for this event, uh, Takeda, Amgen, and uh, Janssen. I'm very pleased to welcome uh, my guests uh, for this uh, conference series. Uh, to my left, I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Mary B. Mateos uh, from the University of Salamanca in Spain. Hi, so Brian. Pleased for you to be here. And uh, Dr. Joe McHale uh, from uh, uh, a couple of different places, uh, translational <laughs> gen genomics uh, in uh, uh, Phoenix, Arizona, but we're very pleased that he's also uh, the Chief Medical Officer for the International Myeloma Foundation. Great to so be here, Brian. Very, very pleased about that. So this evening we have five areas for discussion, which have all been uh, very actively discussed at this year's ASH. And so uh, I'm going to take you through a step at a time and we'll get comments about each of these. Smoldering myeloma, frontline therapy, the significance of uh, particular ASH testing, the immune therapies, and then some of the more novel therapies and combinations that have been discussed uh, here at ASH this year. And so the first topic is uh, smoldering myeloma, and there really is considerable uh, interest in smoldering myeloma, particularly high-risk uh, smoldering myeloma. And obviously the question is, what exactly is high-risk smoldering myeloma? How do we define that? And then perhaps even more importantly, at this point in time in 2019, 2020, uh, how should it be managed? And so the International Myeloma Work, Working Group has been uh, working really hard in this area and, and has analyzed over a thousand patients with high-risk smoldering myeloma to assess the predictive factors. And so we started with one idea which was evaluated by the Mayo Clinic team looking at what is called the 22020 model where the uh, serum M component uh, is two or greater, the free light ratio uh, greater than 20, and the bone marrow percentage uh, uh, 20%. We have in addition looked at a risk score model where uh, one can take in the exact values that a patient has, and so we can have a different combination of these different factors to achieve a score which can be a high risk score or for the lower values, a low risk score. And uh, from my perspective, actually, th the, the ability to identify a, a, a low risk score is just as important as the high risk score. Uh, now, the question is, what is the, the rationale uh, to potentially treat this group of patients? So to treat the disease early, uh, one uh, idea which uh, I know that myself and Mary V are <laughs> quite committed to <laughs> is to attempt to achieve a cure. Uh, uh, the, obviously, the downsides to that is that one does not want to cause harm and was, uh, one does not want to uh, produce some sort of a negative clonal selection, and mm -hmm. so one needs to pay attention to that. It's pretty <laughs> dramatic right now that there are over 50 trials going on in uh, this uh, space uh, looking at high-risk smoldering myeloma. Those, uh, a selection of those are li listed on the left of, of this slide. Uh, I think that uh, similar to the, 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 the CURE trials, there is one with the KRD, which does show significant MRD negativity. The others are uh, what one could say is lesser therapy, and they do not have uh, achieving MRD negativity as a goal. And so, what are the results uh, using the caesar trier combination of KRD transplant and then consolidation and maintenance? And uh, Mary B, you presented these data that you know very well, and just to emphasize that the response is improving and that the uh, MRD negativity rate is uh, at 62%, something uh, very important to, to be aware of. And so Mary V also updated the uh, PFS and overall survival data, which are obviously uh, very impressive at this time point, and, and she can comment uh, more about that in a second. But perhaps uh, uh, rather surprisingly, uh, what was of tremendous interest at this year's ASS was the use of mass spectrometry to evaluate this population of patients. 
And so mass spectrometry uh, defines molecular mass and the, the intensity of the uh, spectrum indicates the amount of the protein. And this is a very precise uh, approach which identifies the protein and does tell you precisely how much is there. So what did the results show? Well, uh, looking at the patients throughout the disease, it was impressive to look at uh, the comparison initially between the SPEP results and the quantitative mass spec. And you can see in each situation, mass spec was more sensitive. If you then look at the comparison with NGF, again, uh, looking for uh, positivity, uh, mass spec was actually uh, more frequently positive. And so looking in a combination of scenarios, uh, one that is particularly interesting, what about the patients who are negative uh, by NGF but have a persistent spike by mass spectrometry? And so a couple of explanations were presented and discussed. Does this mean that there's patchy disease that was not picked up on a bone marrow test? Or maybe there's extramedullary disease. My sense is that there's some uh, emphasis toward the first that maybe it's more to do with patchy disease. So thinking about smoldering myeloma, I've listed uh, four uh, particular questions here. Uh, how do you feel about the criteria? Do we need to do more, more work? Are we starting to cure some of those patients? And how do you feel about those single agent therapies in comparison right now? And what will be the impact of uh, mass spectrometry? Excellent the topic to start this uh, conference series after ASH meeting. Smoldering definitely is a hot topic to debate. I think that the definition of high risk was much more confusing in the past because now, as you mentioned, the International Myeloma Working Group has been doing a great effort in order to homogenize, in order to harmonize the definition of high risk. So now I think that the 220 model is worldwide available. Yep. And, uh, I think that this is going to be the uniform model every investigator can use in order to identify high-risk smoldering myeloma, patients that uh, we know that will have a 50% progression risk of progression to multiple myeloma. Yeah. And uh, concerning if uh, we are going to start to cure some patients, uh, hopefully, yes. yes. <laughs> and in fact, you and uh, I are working on a different projects, similar projects, maybe if we are going to be able to cure some patients with KRD, transplant KRD and Lendex maintenance, you will definitely be able to cure more patients because the approach is similar, but uh, adding the monoclonal mm -hmm. antibody there, there. daratumumab. Yes. I think that this strategy definitely is encouraging. We need, of course, in our GMCs are trial longer follow-up in order right. to see how the outcome is, but definitely it is possible to offer the cure to some smoldering myeloma patients. Personally, I consider that uh, if we have to choose versus single agent therapy versus uh, combination or much more intensive approach similar to that uh, we do to myeloma patients, Personally, I consider that high-risk smoldering is a closer disease to the myeloma. Yes. And this means that maybe the future will be to treat them as multiple More myeloma. Like myeloma yes. And maybe in the upcoming years, the term of smoldering maybe will disappear. I don't know, right. but high-risk smoldering will be myeloma and low-risk will be MGAS. Right, exactly. So, so I think the two of us are on the same page with that. I think that... Uh, it, it's uh, a way to look at smoldering is it's just really early myeloma uh, and, 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 and deserves treatment yeah. uh, as, as, as myeloma. So, uh, how do you feel I, about I think that? you can make three, because right. I think we all agree. Uh, you know, I, even as I explain this to patients, I think of it as, you know, we used to define myeloma once there was true damage to the kidney or the bone or to the blood. Uh, and uh, pardon the analogy, but sometimes I think of it as, if I'm, if I'm going for a run and I'm heading towards a cliff, uh, you don't have to wait till I'm falling off the cliff to know I'm in trouble. So right. we changed the definition of myeloma and drew a line, let's say 50 feet away from the cliff to say, right. if you get this yeah. close, right, you're in right. trouble. 
But, but I think that slim crab criteria that we right. added to the crab criteria, none of us think that's the perfect line. No, no. Maybe, we need, a, uh, maybe we need a wider crab, yeah, maybe, maybe 75 feet from the cliff. And I think that's what we're doing with that. That risk score is particularly helpful. I mean, I actually yeah. use it in the clinic. I bring yeah. it out and I have the patient yes. look at it and then we, well, we, we calculate we have, we the We have an app together. that's going to be released yeah. soon for that. That's wonderful. And so I think what will happen is if, let's say, we're 50 feet from the cliff now, maybe we'll move it back to 75 feet from the cliff. And I agree absolutely with you, Mary V, that those patients between, let's say, the 75 and 50 feet, they're basically myeloma patients. Yes. And we should have an early treatment, curative intense approach. My worry is if we go too far back with yes. heavy treatment, we're over-treating people. Yes. And I think that, that's, the, I agree that's we'll, the delicate balance. Exactly. Yeah. I think we'll likely eliminate the, the true diagnosis of smoldering myeloma. And I couldn't agree with you more. I think the single agent studies are concerning because they're not really, none of us think that one drug can, and the way that we have a can powerful really impact. change yeah. the nature of myeloma. Absolutely. What no. you want people to do is never to run towards the cliff. And that, that you've got right. to do much earlier. Right, right. Uh, and I think that's the way we're moving. As for the mass spectrometry, I actually think with time, as we work out the nuanced details, uh, I think it actually will be extremely helpful because it's a much quicker test, it's a much cheaper test, a more accurate test in general, Absolutely. as we're seeing. And the day could come where it will simplify. For those of us who have to look at serum protein electrophoresis in the lab, I mean, patients right. hang on to that one exact number, exactly. but if they saw how we come to that number, yeah, it's yeah. not always simple. Exactly. Yeah. So, so maybe uh, back to you, Mary V. So, um, in the patients who are NGF negative but uh, mass spec positive, uh, I know that one of those patients has actually been the one that has relapsed. Uh, do you see that it uh, might be helpful in that type of a scenario? Yes, yeah, so definitely QIP mass uh, is much more sensitive. Uh, and uh, together with your comment, I think that the mass is going to optimize the timing point at which we have to do the bone marrow. Yes. And this is extremely important, maybe not for physicians, but for, for patients, because yes. the timing at which we will do the bone marrow in order to see if the minimal residual disease is positive or not is going to be much more accurate. Absolutely, I agree. So sometimes we do the bone marrow and then it's still positive and you have to repeat it uh, one or two months later. Yes, exactly. And concerning patients with the next generation flow negative, mass positive, maybe the bone marrow is patchy and maybe the bone marrow respiration has been done in a place in which there was not uh, plasma cells. This has not been uh, well evaluated in our gene CESAR trial because all patients were asymptomatic. This means uh, yes. that uh, extramedullary yes. disease was not present. So right. it, definitely this is something in which we have to investigate much more in the symptomatic myeloma setting. Right, right. And we have, as we'll go through these uh, uh, areas today, we'll see opportunities where this could be assessed in, in uh, patients with active myeloma. Yes, this is uh, something that we are going to do in the upcoming months. Right, and right. I think it speaks to, you know, to conclude this thought, it really, it speaks to the fact that myeloma is difficult to measure with one test. I mean, we're right. going to learn with PET scans and other things, you know, so many other diseases, there's one sentinel test. Here, it's more than one. Yeah. And, and there, there aren't just going to be small exceptions to the rule. We, we want right. as many angles on the crime scene as possible to know exactly right, what's right. happening. Absolutely. You know. but, but I'm especially pleased that we have a blood test that can be potentially very helpful. And we're not going to talk about it today, but one can also uh, measure the monoclonal plasma cells in the blood, another blood yeah. test which can help uh, guide Less us. Less marrows are good for patients. Right, right. there yeah, you absolutely. go. Yeah.